Right. Ever since the start of Level 1 Techs, you guys have been asking us, you know, through Twitter, through YouTube, through the forum, you know, what can I do? What, what projects can I do? What can I do with my old hardware? Uh, what can I do with my free time? Can you guys help me learn how to develop something? And well, you know, we're definitely here to help you guys. It's not really our job to tell you what to do per se. So part of the philosophy when we started talking about what, what is this going to be? What are we going to make it? And part of the reason we chose the level one name, which many of you have soundly criticized since then, <laughs> is how to get more foundations, how to start from the beginning. And this is actually going to be a series. It's not going to be a how to do this specific thing or let's look at this specific hardware. It's how do I figure it all out? Where, where do I start? And I don't know what a good way to say that is. I, I think it should be the joy of computing. We made it abundantly clear that the name of this thing wasn't going to be the joy of computing. I mean, we discussed it like six different times, and here it is. The name of it is not the joy of computing, and that's the end of it. The most traditional way that people get into this field is through schooling, you know, college. Um, all three of us went to college, I went to college, uh, not for anything necessarily tech-related, but for design. And for me, that was a really good experience. Um, I had really great professors, I had a really great cohort and colleagues who helped me grow really quickly in four years. I also got my first internship through college, um, got a lot of other great job opportunities through college, and I feel like I was just really well prepared for the job market once I got out. College can definitely give you access to some opportunities in terms of you know having access to smart people, having access to technology. I mean, where else could you play with a particle accelerator? Or where else could you, you know, meet programmers from you know all different walks of life and, and that sort of thing? But college is not necessarily the answer for everybody. Yeah, especially and it's it's becoming more and more true that college is something that you really have to question in terms of financial. How much debt? do you want to come out of college in? You enjoy uh, scratching out that student loan check every no, month? No, yeah, it's, it's not even a check. I pay extra on it every month because I don't, I don't want to fall behind. So it's, it's a, it's a non-trivial amount of money. It will be years paying that back. And also the quality of a diploma, especially a bachelor's degree, is less and less in the workforce every year. The other thing that you have to think about, and this affected even us, is the education system is, it moves very slowly, it's glacial, but technology moves incredibly fast and it accelerates all the time. So the stuff we learned in school, the, you know, the foundation, the theory is great, but the technology that they teach you is antiquated by the time you get out. Yeah, it's definitely true. Uh, I worked through college and I think I have a unique perspective on the technology in use as it was from like the job experience versus the stuff that we were learning in class. I feel like that the stuff that I learned in class, I wouldn't have taken away nearly as much had I not had the job experience to go with it. And so somebody working in the industry or somebody doing an internship in college or something like that, those kind of things can be really important to get the value out of the education. Another thing that's true now that wasn't, at least when Wendell and I went to college, is that you can get the same information from the internet. It's literally all out there. And we, of course, had the internet, but it wasn't quite what it is today. It's and a different world. You really can't, if you're self-motivated, if you're a self-teacher, and you, you know, can discipline yourself, you can learn all the exact same stuff. You don't get the piece of paper that might get your foot in the door, but you can definitely get the knowledge. And this video might be a good start, or at least this series might be a good start into getting some of the discipline uh, for some of those things. At least we're gonna show you some of the tips and tricks that we wish that we'd known when we were starting our careers so that you can sort of self figure it out and self get stuff done. You'd be surprised the little things that you can do to help yourself actually get stuff done so it's not quite so insurmountable. So where do you start on this journey? What we thought about, what is the most basic step? Where do you begin when you're thinking about learning technology, beginning your computing journey? We sat down and we tried to think about it and we all came up with the same answer, basically. Which was a surprising one. It's not about, you know, what programs you're using or, you know, whether you know you want to go into design or, or development or whatever. What really matters is sort of the, the meta game. And that means, you know, preparing yourself mentally and physically to get to work. Let's talk about optimizing your workspace. Now the most obvious 
thing about optimizing your workspace when you're working with computers is your monitor. Your monitor real estate has a huge impact. Having more than one, especially if you're going into programming, is almost a requirement. And web development, you need to see the results of your work on one screen and what you're working on on the other. You can't underestimate your monitor real estate. And ideally having one for your like your PSD too, so like three is great. And you then really, have, having I, one vertical. like. But you know, you also have to monitor your email, so four is four. better, right? I mean... Uh, you need more. <laughs> At least 12 million pixels across you know all of your all of your just many do you, you have six right yeah at the, on on the the most complicated system yeah but you know 4k i've also got some systems that have a single 4k monitor and a couple of monitors in the periphery so that's an option as well yeah, the point is you a lot of space is always great and the more you can give yourself i think you really will feel that you never have enough yeah, yeah. so monitors don't underestimate if you think about oh i'm gonna go to starbucks and work on my laptop <laughs> no you, you also don't really need to spend a lot of money. Like we talk about our giant 40 inch 4K monitors a lot, but uh, you can also just build a patchwork of monitors, especially if you're doing programming and things like that. Just keep plugging monitors into your computer. Most modern computers can handle three or four monitors. Just go to the drugstore, go to Goodwill, go to you know your local flea market and get the $5 monitor, it's fine. Get whatever is the highest resolution you can get. I don't think Wendell's ever been to a drugstore. And what alternate reality do you buy monitors at a drugstore? What kind of monitor would you buy at a CVS? That doesn't exist. Well, you know, any store could be a monitor store if you want it bad enough. The second monitor at my for my home setup, I've got like a Korean monitor and then for my secondary one where I keep all my code, that one's literally, I got it for $7 at the surplus place that we got our garbage PC from. And it works fine, like that's totally fine for what I'm using it for. We are still using dozens of surplus monitors, business cast offs, stuff that was on sale from Dell. So don't underestimate, you know, discount surplus hardware. Yeah, don't be too proud to run junk. I, for a while, a couple of my monitors didn't have any sort of bezel. It was just, <laughs> the raw metal, it worked. Fine, does, yeah. does the job and that's what matters. Hard to push the buttons, but it works. It's got a visa mount, it's fine. Now, of course, the second thing you want to think about is your desk. You got to have something to put all those monitors on. Uh, a sort of a periphery thing is like, you know, how do you mount all those monitors? How do you arrange them? And that's kind of part of your desk, you know. How are you setting up your workspace to be something that's easy for you to get what you need done? No. And, yeah, I know what you're going to say. Uh, some of us, some of us, I'm not looking at anybody in particular, <laughs> but uh, some of us are, are a little messier than others. They, they have some clutter. They leave some food around. I cannot work that way. I have to have my desk sorted out. I have to have my pens in their cup, in their place, ready to go. If I don't have my desk organized, especially because a lot of times I'm working between the computer and then also sketching on paper, I, it's easier for me to get distracted if my desk is messy. I think Krista might have a compulsion. She cleaned my teapot once with Windex. It was not a pleasant tea experience after that. The point is, whatever works for you. You know, you have to get a setup where everything's where you expect it to be, whether that's in a pile somewhere or neatly organized, and you have to have enough room to work. The thing you should be thinking is, what can I do to my workspace to make things easier for future me to deal with stuff? And whatever that is, that should be at the front of your mind when you're sort of getting ready to leave your workspace or you're working in your workspace. Now finally, and this is one that a lot of people don't really think about, and they certainly don't invest much into it, and that is your chair. And of course, we should note that some people like to sit on yoga balls and some people like to stand. If you're one of those people, more power to you. It takes more planning when you're getting your desk, but whatever. But we're, we're talking now to the chair people. The chairs, I mean, you can do so much with a good chair. Don't underestimate a good chair. If nothing else, go to a good, reputable office supply company. I'm not talking about Office Depot or Office Max. I'm talking about somewhere that you can try out uh, brands like Steelcase. Not necessarily Herman Miller, because like Herman Miller is like, you know, the Silicon Valley. It's, it's become the meme chair. But I am super into steel case chairs, and the particular chair that I really like is a steel case leap chair, which retails for like a grand, but it has a 10 year warranty, and you can often pick them up in, in used office supply places for about 300 bucks a chair, which is pretty reasonable, I think. Now you might be thinking, $1,000 for a chair? What are these people smoking? 
But in reality, the chair really will help you out throughout your day. I mean, you're gonna be in this thing a lot. And it's not crazy to spend that money on a chair rather than a processor upgrade or a new video card. You know, your entry-level programs don't need a better video card. Now this brings up the, another uh, financial discussion here. We're telling you, hey, get these cool monitors, get a good desk, get a great chair, get a steel case chair. We're not telling you to run out and spend money that you don't have. Just like we talked about the education, if you can afford to go to college, go for it. If you can't and you're coming out $250,000 in debt, don't do that. If you don't have $1,000 to spend on a chair, don't don't be like, hey, those guys on YouTube told me to come and get a chair. I'm going to take out a loan. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to take out a loan and do I'm that. I'm going to head down to the payday loan for a job I don't have, and I'm going to grab that $1,000. No. You build your workstation as you can afford it, and that becomes you know sort of a reinforcing thing. Like, hey, I'm leveling up. I can afford a chair now. You will see a horrible yellow chair in the background of some of my videos. It's almost identical to a chair that I used from high school all the way through college. It doesn't have wheels, it just had four legs, it costs five dollars, and it is insanely comfortable. It looks like it would be the most uncomfortable thing in the world. No, it was very comfortable. This is the power of trying out chairs. It's also indestructible. I'm sure that they will be here after the heat death of the universe. Meanwhile, I'm still waiting to invest in a good chair. I'm using a drafting table for a computer desk right now, <laughs> hoping to make an upgrade at like the end of the month, but... Not following our own advice. Yeah, well, I think I think though well, I think it's totally worth it. Though well, she's you're right. got those student loans. So yeah. You got to make the choice. Yeah. Yeah. The other big thing that you can do is to prepare yourself mentally. Actually, get in a routine and do some things to help you uh, work a little bit more efficiently, work a little bit better. So one big thing that you might not plan for, but is definitely going to happen to you is distractions especially if we're talking about you know you're going to teach yourself you're going to use what you have home office whatever working on the internet going to be a ton of distractions oh this is really hard what's happening on reddit what's yeah. happening on what's happening on imager man i should read this camping subreddit for 20 minutes or you know you're reading it's like how do i solve this programming problem and this blog has some clickbait articles Oh, that's super interesting i better read about oh, that weather.com's the worst for that yeah. can you believe what they found in that volcano I certainly can't. Who puts a drone in a volcano? I could read about this thing rather than actually getting work done. No, those are the those are time vampires. All those little time vampires are stealing your time and your time is precious. Now the other thing is you already have distractions built into your computer most likely. Do you have Steam running? Do you see that your friends are playing Battlegrounds without you? Ooh. <laughs> Ah, you really would That's be rough. fun. You'd love to join in there, right? How about, you know, you got IRC open, Discord. Uh, are you are you watching chat? Well, during your workday, probably shouldn't be. Yeah, uh, when you've got projects to work on or when you're doing something, you need an easy way to turn those distractions off. So maybe setting those programs to not auto start and only starting them when you need them or maybe even doing a batch file so that you can start a group of programs. I mean, you know, if you really wanted to, you could dual boot, not will boot between different operating systems, but actually have one uh, uh, installation of your operating system for doing work and one installation of your operating system for playing games and doing all kinds of fun stuff. Also think about your phone, which is another super easy way to just tune out and distract yourself. And you know, do you really need that on your desk at all times? Maybe not. Set up uh, something I like to do too is like set up playlists for music because it can be really distracting for me when I'm constantly like switching back to a YouTube tab and like what song do I want to listen to now and it's like I just need to find a playlist and just listen to it for like an hour <laughs> and then I won't have to touch the music for a while and then you know keep myself on track that way. Well, well see that's funny because like with programming I can't no I need there's no music no audio anything can't listen to a podcast I need to focus a hundred percent but when I'm like you know, orchestrating system upgrades across the enterprise and I've got a hundred servers that I need to update. Yeah, I can totally listen to a podcast, Weird Al, whatever, it's fine. See, I have to have music uh, at least a little bit, you know. Notice he doesn't say music, he yeah. says Weird Al. Because it's literally <laughs> the, the only, only music. music he'll listen to. I kind of like classical music too, but I don't have a really great MP3 collection of that, so. But the point is, you're, you're you're mentally switching gears when you get distracted. You're taking your mind off of what you're doing. When you're doing programming, there's like this, this buffer time of getting in the zone and then you immediately will get out of it. 
And switching mental states is another thing that you really need to think about when you're thinking about your workspace. Yeah, when we were putting together this video, you know, we were trying to think of a way we could really quickly and easily convey what it is. And I'm not really sure that, that I mean, it's even it even goes beyond uh, that because you, you've got to think about, you know, like future you. When future you comes back to this project, will they be really, will, will they be able to get up to speed with it really quickly? Will they, will they be able to look at what you've done and really understand it or, or do something with it or whatever? Uh, the next sort of point we want to talk about was, was scheduling as well. I, again, on that point of, you know, making sure you don't screw up future you, keeping a consistent schedule is a huge thing that you can do to not screw future you because if you're working on something and you work on it really hard for like a week and then you wait a month before you pick it back up again, you're going to spend, you know, three <laughs> days time. just trying to figure out what the heck was I thinking? Like, well, not just that, but, you know, if we talk about if you're going to go to school, that's one thing. If you're going to do it on your own, it's an entirely different thing. And that self-discipline, are you going to wake up at 8 a.m. and get started on your work when no one is telling you to? See, when you go to school, in terms of scheduling, they're going to do it for you. You might not even think about that, but they're forcing you into a good habit there. And you got to do it yourself if you're going to work for yourself. At my school, like I had an independent study program in the arts you could do. That was like a trap because you had to set your own schedule. You had to do a proposal. <laughs> And there were a few people who was like, well, you know, I'm going to say that I'm, I'm doing four credit hours for this, but I'm going to show up to critique for the week with like two sketches. And those people failed. <laughs> and so it was like this weird trap where it's like, you have, if you're going to make this schedule, if you're going to do this class, you have to do it or, or we're just going to kick you out of the program. Yeah, so I like to think about it mentally a little differently. It's like, you know, if, you, if you're in class or you have a scheduled activity, say from 8 to 9.15 a.m., a lot of people fall into the mental trap of, I just have to make it to 9.15 a.m. And so you can do a lot of things to while away the time. But what we want you to do is think about it a little differently. It's like you owe that task an hour and 15 minutes of time. And if you can't honestly say at the end of that hour and 15 minutes that you spent an hour and 15 minutes working on that, then you've got to work on it some more. That will help you get into that mode. It's also important to try and get as large a block of time for each task as you can. We talked about distractions, but even without distractions, if you work on different things and switch in and out, it's not as efficient. And part of that is finding a way to plan out your tasks and have something to keep track of them. Don't count on just like, well, I know I need to work on this for this many hours and this for this many hours. You need a, a planning tool. For me, this is like my forte. This is like what I like to do. <laughs> Uh, I use something called AC. We use that internally both for level one and Active for... Active Collab. Yeah, sorry. Active Collab is the name of it. We use it internally here at level one and for uh, the consulting business we do on the side. Or I guess it's our day job. We're actually consultants full time. <laughs> but side. This is the side. This is the side. <laughs> but uh, AC is what I use for that. And what I like about it is I can put all my notes for a client in there. You know, here's my meeting minutes. Here's all my files. Here's my engagement letters. Here's uh, links to the presentations we've done. And then if I have to bring in another developer later on, you know, if I get busy with something else, instead of spending 20 minutes looping them in on the project and like the history of it, I just send them a link. Ajira uh, has some really good tools. Those are also really expensive, but they do source management and project management and wikis and, and things like that. But again, this is all about helping future you and other people that you work with. Uh, it, it may be even, you know, like, you know, you could be like Captain Super Programmer, but eventually you will have to work in a team. And so that's a big part of this. Yeah, uh, you might be thinking, not me, I don't work in a team, but if you succeed, eventually, you know, you're gonna have to work with a filthy designer. <laughs> you're even like, something I wish more programmers would do is like, just leave comments. Leave, com <laughs> leave comments in your code because someone, even if you're not gonna necessarily work with someone, you're probably gonna have to hand your project off to someone at some point. Having those comments, you know, don't screw yourself, but also don't screw other people. Like, there's you can even get into like the philosophy of comments. Like, if you want to go down the rabbit hole on this whole uh, this this sort of meta game that we're talking about in terms of you know mental state and preparing yourself and things like that, commenting the code is like the comment for what the code does is useless because a good programmer would be able to read the code and know what it does, but why it's doing the thing that it's doing or why this is here that is an infinitely more valuable comment. In summary, maybe the best way to wrap all this up is to tell you that 
when you're learning about technology or you're working in technology, whatever you're doing, you need to think of everything as a resource. Think about the amount of mental time you put into something that's a resource. The amount of money that goes into the project or the money that goes into setting up your, your workspace. Uh, the amount of time you spend on organization. All of those are finite resources and resource maximization is the name of the game. Now, we've got some other tips and tricks, obviously. We have a whole series of these planned out. The next one is gonna be about problem solving, how to ask questions. Uh, if you guys have any tips and tricks for this video or if you've got maybe some suggestions for the next one, feel free to leave a comment below. How can you ask a question without wasting somebody else's time? That's resource maximization for the other party. Yes, please. <laughs> Remember, don't screw yourself. Don't screw other people. Don't be time vampires. See ya. See ya.